What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about irritable bowel syndrome, also referred to as IBS. This is part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this video, you understand the topic after watching it, please support us. You can do that by hitting the like button, commenting down in the comment section, and subscribing. Also, benefit yourself. If you guys don't have time to watch the video, you need a little bit of a quick recap, a reminder, you can do that. You wanna know how? Go down in the description box below, click on the link that goes to our website. We got great notes, great illustrations, we got quizzes that'll test your knowledge for some good repetition-based learning. Become a member and enjoy those premium features. Also, check out some of the other cool things that we have on that website. Let's talk a little bit about IBS. IBS is really one of those diseases where it's not truly well understood, but I still think that we should have a little bit of understanding of the pathophysiology, even though it's not concrete and we have a very strong understanding of it. I think it'll help you to at least understand the common classic findings that is usually present in patients who have IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. There's three pathophysiological concepts that this has been supposedly linked to. One is visceral hypersensitivity. It's actually pretty straightforward. Usually patients have some type of food that they have ingested. These foods, if you will, are very interesting. And usually what they're more commonly linked to, it's usually linked to like carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, you know, anything like oligosaccharides, disaccharides, this is that food, if you will, that may be a potential cause. So food is a potential big cause or trigger in behind the concept of IBS. So food, is usually a very strong trigger. And I think one of the biggest ones that has been linked to this is carbohydrates. Let me explain why. The concept is, is that whenever the patients have ingested this food that's rich in carbohydrates, two things happen. One is these carbohydrates are osmotically active. And what they do is they pull water into the bowel wall. So if I yank water, in combination with these carbohydrates, I yank a bunch of water into the bowel wall. What am I gonna do? Well, it's kind of represented here with this blue color. I'm gonna have a bunch of water and I'm gonna have a bunch of carbohydrates that is accumulating within this bowel. As you have this, you're gonna start stretching out on the bowel wall. So carbohydrates will cause, again, lots of water to be kind of sucked into the bowel lumen. It'll cause increasing stretch or distension. When that happens, there's particular stretch receptors that are present within the bowel wall. These stretch receptors are super sensitive. And the reason why they may be sensitive isn't completely understood. It may be that these patients have a little bit more of what's called central sensitization, which may be related to underlying psychiatric disorders, things like depression, fibromyalgia, anxiety. But what happens is when these stretch receptors are super stimulated, they send signals from the gut all the way to the brain. And so all of this is going to be these stretch signals, if you will. So this is gonna be all these stretch signals that are get sent to the central nervous system. All right, and so just to kind of recap it again, we stimulate the stretch receptors, they're super hyperactive. The primary trigger was carbohydrates. Why? Because carbohydrates will increase the water being pulled into the bowel. Increase water in the lumen, and that'll increase the stretch of the bowel. And that will then activate that intense stretch. And whenever you activate that intense stretch, in most patients, it won't cause profound pain. But in these patients, they may have some type of hypersensitivity of some sort. So again, what's the cause of this increased sensitivity? It could be some type of you know, psychiatric disorder. That's potentially been linked to it, it's not guaranteed, but it could be. And so some things that this has been linked to is potentially things like fibromyalgia, depression, or anxiety. So again, fibromyalgia, depression, and anxiety. Now one of the concepts behind this is that if you cause this intense stretch, what it'll do is send these signals to the central nervous system. Your central nervous system will be made aware of these signals and they'll amplify the signal. And so it'll really, really amplify the signal more than normal. And one of the profound effects of that is that it's gonna cause intense abdominal pain. 
All right, and so these patients will experience some abdominal pain that is usually related to the consumption of food, usually foods that are rich in carbohydrates, okay? That's one concept. The other kind of like concept behind this besides a increasing food trigger and increasing sensitization that maybe amplifies this effect is it could be hypermotility as well that's involved. So we know that it's not just the sensitivity of those stretch receptors, it also could be that the bowel kind of spasms undesirably and more excessively. So let's say for example, same thing, I have the food which is the trigger. This food which is the trigger, which is oftentimes what we say carbohydrates, will do what? Pull water into the lumen, stretch the bowel. So we already know that. So let's already kind of do that part here. This is going to cause stretching of the bowel. When we stretch the bowel, what do we activate? We activate these stretch receptors. Now, one thing that we know is, is this will induce abdominal pain. But here's the other concept that's really cool. These stretch receptors are often able to create what's called a reflexive movement. So what they do is they can create via this kind of enteric plexus, they may create a reflexive movement that causes contraction of the actual smooth muscle. This is the smooth muscle within the bowel wall, right? Here's your smooth muscle. What if I stimulate a very powerful reflex contraction? Sometimes we call this spasm, if you will, of the bowel. So I'm really going to increase this reflex contraction, stimulate these bowels to undergo intense contraction. When you cause that intense contraction, that may worsen their pain, but you know what else it may do? If you cause weird like motility, what do you think is gonna to happen to their bowels? They're gonna move things along pretty frequently. And oftentimes, if you have increasing motility, and this says hypermotility, you'll move things through the bowels relatively quickly and it won't have enough time for proper absorption. And oftentimes this can lead to diarrhea. Now, this is by far, I'd say, one of the most common presentations is diarrhea and abdominal pain, usually related to food consumption. And so we call this one IBSD. But you can have other types of IBSs that are not consistently present with diarrhea. You could have IBS C, where constipation is the predominant symptom. Or maybe you have a little bit of a mixture of the two, where it's IBS M, and it's a mixture. I think the biggest thing to remember here is that these patients have alterations in their bowel habits. But by far the most common type of alteration of bowel habits is IBSD. So if I see a patient with abdominal pain and altered bowel habits, I'm really starting to think about IBS, okay? Now, with that being said, we have hypermotility, which causes reflexive intense contraction. We have hypersensitivity, where the actual sensitivity of the nerves within the bowel wall in response to stretch is another profound factor that causes pain. The last one here is that there may be an altered microbiome. Now, one thing that's really interesting is, if we go back to this mechanism, let's say that you have two concepts here. One is you have carbohydrates that are rich within your meal. They pull water, so water is pulled, pulled into lumen, and that increases the stretch, right? The other concept here is that carbohydrates are also metabolized by bacteria. So they can get metabolized by bacteria. The concept behind that is, is that this will cause an increase in gas. So now I'm gonna have a lot of gas, and I'm gonna have a lot of this water being pulled into the bowel. The combination of increasing gas and water being pulled into the bowel together do what? What this will do is, is this will cause more stretch. Right? So as more water is pulled into the bowel, more gas is produced, this will increase the stretch. Now, one of the concepts is, is that in certain patients, what we don't really understand is, do they have a little bit more like weird bacteria 
and these bacteria metabolize these carbohydrates much quicker or other kinds of metabolites within the diet and cause more gas to be produced and that's what causes more distension and more stretching, it may be. And so it could be that there's lots of bacteria, let's just use this as the example, there's maybe some type of weird microbiome in these patients and they metabolize carbohydrates much easier and it leads to profound increase in gas. And when there's this increase in gas, you betcha it distends, stretches the actual bowel wall, if you stretch and distend the bowel wall, what's the concepts that we already talked about here? It's pretty straightforward. You may increase the stretch receptor activation, right? That's one mechanism. Or, and that may send these signals down here that increases pain, or it may create a reflex contraction, which causes the smooth muscle to intensely spasm and cause altered hypermotility. So you guys get the point here. This could precipitate, what we already talked about, increasing in pain or increase in spasm. So I think the big concept here is that these patients usually have abdominal pain related to whenever they eat food, usually carbohydrate rich foods. The reason why they may have a hypersensitivity could be related to underlying psychiatric disorders potentially that could contribute. But this is the big concept. They either have stretching of the bowel lumen that causes increased sensitivity of the stretch receptors or increasing stretch of the lumen that causes reflex spasm or they have some weird microbiome where they have more bacteria producing more gas stretching the actual bowel lumen, causing again, reflexive pain and reflexive spasm. If I see a patient with abdominal pain, altered bowel habits, particularly diarrhea, I really wanna think about IBS. Now let's move into how do we diagnose IBS. It's really a complete clinical diagnosis and we use what's called the Rome 4 criteria, which says, okay, do they have recurrent cramping abdominal pain? that is at least happening more or equal to one day out of the week for at least three plus months. If they are, then the next thing that you have to ask is do they have at least two of the following in combination with that? So recurring abdominal pain for more than one day out of the week for at least three months, <clears throat> plus pain related to their defecation. In other words, whenever they go and they defecate, do they have a relief of their pain, oh, okay, well then if yes, that's one, one point in addition to the recurrent abdominal pain. Do they have a change in the stool frequency? In other words, are they having more frequent bowel movements associated with the recurrent abdominal pain? And lastly, is there a change in the stool appearance in combination with the recurrent abdominal pain? If they have at least two of these three plus recurrent abdominal pain for at least greater than one day out of the week for three plus months, they have IBS and there's the diagnosis. Now, treating IBS is a little bit different because really you're trying to avoid triggers. And some of the things that we think may be a trigger for IBS in combination with fibromyalgia, depression, anxiety, is certain gas producing foods, things that cause more distension of the bowel wall, which triggers the hypermotility, triggers the high visceral hypersensitivity. So you really should try to modify your diet and there is a very specialized diet called the FODMAP diet that is gonna be more geared for a patient with IBS. The other thing is the abdominal pain. This abdominal pain is usually due to visceral hypersensitivity and a lot of contractile movement of the small bowel. And so the goal here is to try to reduce some of that type of activity. And so we may give things like dicyclamine or hyoscyamine, which may help with this particular process, or tricyclic antidepressants. The concept behind dicyclamine and hyoscyamine really quickly before we move into constipation is that these may work to decrease the contraction that anti, they can, they can act as antispasmodics. They reduce that hypermotility. And tricyclic antidepressants may play more of a role in reducing the hypersensitivity process. Avoiding the gas producing foods can help with that altered microbiome. If you avoid foods that will lead to a lot of gassy production, you may reduce that excessive stretching of the bowel wall. Now, patients can present with constipation or they can present with diarrhea or a mixture of the two. Constipation is more properly, uh, prominently treated with things like polyethylene glycol, which is more of a type of laxative or lubaprostone or linaclotide, which helps in a little bit more of a process of helping to really 
increase the watery component of the stool, which helps to really allow for stool to be moved on a, lot, a little bit quicker. The other thing is if patients present with diarrhea, which is the more common feature, you can treat these patients with loperamide. All right, my friends, that covers irritable bowel syndrome. I hope that made sense. I hope that you guys did enjoy it. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.